a lot of fun. So I have several things for you today. I am the co-founder of Monterey County Skeptics. We have been in existence since I think 2007, something like that more or less. And uh, this is the first time we've actually done a camp. I have wanted to do something like this for the longest time. Um, but, you know, I just don't sit still long enough to actually do something that plans this far in advance. We are going to be <coughs> here until 4, 5-ish. It depends on how, how we, you know, how this goes, if we don't have any complications and, and so on. Uh, we're going to have a 30-minute lunch. I hope you guys brought your lunch or, or you know, we're okay with eating a church's chicken next door. <laughs> there is a bathroom in the back over here. It's just a one person at a time kind of thing. And um, if you can, wait until the speaker has spoken and then go, because obviously you're going to have to climb underneath the slide and go around to, to use the bathroom. And I will be filming, and there's other people who are going to be filming. So if you have any problem with, like, you're a vampire or something like that, you don't reproduce on film, and or you don't want to be on film, or you're not supposed to be here, and you don't have evidence of that, um, please let one of us know, and then we'll just kind of turn the camera away from you or something like that. We'll put a big sticker over your face or something like that on the pictures. You can always get behind me because then I will be probably filming you. But I do a lot of video. I do a lot of um, audio and um, I take a lot of photos. So just letting you know ahead of time. Uh, I am on Skepticality Podcast. I don't know if anybody is aware of Skepticality Podcast. Anybody here? Heard of them? Woo! <laughs> Three, four, five, okay. So I am on, this is the oldest skeptic podcast in existence. It has been around, put it this way, when Steve Jobs rolled out iTunes and, pot, and podcasting in general, Skepticality was one of the ones that they featured. There was only like nine. So it's one of the oldest podcasts. I have a segment on there every two weeks. And it just is um, about 80,000 people listen to it every two weeks, 80,000 or so. So it's quite a, we have quite an audience. So one of the things I would like to do today, if you are interested in it, is I would like to record some individual podcast segments with you guys. You know, I'll ask a couple questions like, you know, hey, you know, you're at Skeptic Camp, what do you think, or whatever, I don't know, I'll make up something. And then we'll record it on my phone, I'll edit it down, and we can come up with some nice audio for a podcast. That's one of the things we're going to do. Uh, we do have a lot of books and magazines and business cards and a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff that has got to go home with you and not me. Um, there are some magazines down here. Deborah's waving her hand right over there. There are some t-shirts over there that my son has outgrown and we want them to go away. The skeptic t-shirts, they are worn and they're smaller-ish, but they take them. I mean, you know, these are, these are, these are classics from Skepticism 101 for years and years. Um, I am very approachable. Um, you guys are, you know, if you have any questions whatsoever, you're going to be have no problem coming up to me and talking to me later. I will answer all the questions you might have. There's a lot of stuff going on. Ooh, so we've got a big camera. I like that. <laughs> um, Deborah, right here, wave your hand, Deborah. She's one of the people who knows a lot about this. They turned around and looked after you. Put your hand down. Now wave it. Okay. Now, now that they're looking, there she is. Deborah is the, the genius behind getting this facility for us. And uh, Deborah is also the person to ask of any kind of question that has to do with this building and so on. Um, I could not put on this camp at all without her and without Kathy. Is where? Kathy, there she is. Kathy McKenzie, she's the one responsible for getting a lot of you here in the Herald. Thank you very much. She is going to be lecturing today as well. We do have coffee in the back, too. Oh, in the front? Yeah. We moved it. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it just gets up and moves around. It's great. Um, we do have a meetup group. Monterey County Skeptics has a meetup group. And we also have a Facebook group. So if you're so inclined and you'd like to know more about uh, what Monterey County skeptics do, please join that. And if you are tweeting today, or if you are so inclined to tweet, anybody tweeting today besides myself? Woo! <laughs> All right, there's a tweeter now. I heard a bird. So please uh, use the hashtag uh, MCS Skeptic Camp. And also, if you could. Uh, use the aroba of uh, the at symbol for Skepticamp also on there, that'd be great. We're going to collect all the tweets 
and we're going to put them in a long little list, and it's going to go on something called Lanyard, which some of you guys found. It's a conference website for people to be able to keep and look at all the information for years from now. And, oh, we are going to meet after this event someplace to go hang out and talk because we don't have, you know, that kind of, uh, it's not kind of, if you guys are someplace, you do that too. So I have one little thing that we're going to do. And this is probably going to be a little tiny bit of audio that is going to go, well, not audio, video, that's probably going to go on the Skeptic Camp Wikipedia page. So I just wanted to show that really quickly, but I don't have it here yet. So. Susan? Mm -hmm. Do you want um, Also, there's a donation jar mm -hmm. here for. Can we tell, tell everybody what will I find that Wikipedia page? This facility is maintained by a local peace group, and they would love to have your donation of any amount. There's a jar over there. Okay, so what we're going to do really quick, Glenn, I am actually a little more organized than you think, but um, all this tech. This is Skeptic Camp. I just want to show that to you really quick if you guys can see that over here. This is Skeptic Camp's Wikipedia page. Skeptic Camp has been around for a long time. It is a grassroots thing. A friend of mine uh, is the person who made this. This is Jan Breed. Um, and if you'll notice that the Wikipedia page has a nice little reference. Let's find it right here. You guys can see that. That is just put there like at 4 o'clock this morning when I couldn't sleep. So it says, the first Skeptic Camp in Northern California was hosted by the Monterey County Skeptics in Seaside, California, January 3rd, 2015, making it the first Skeptic Camp in 2015. Woo! Yay. According to organizer Susan Gerbeck, the conference is hoped to, will teach people to think more critically about what they hear. Mentalist and skeptical activist Mark Edward emceed the event right here. And uh, this is on the Skeptic Camp Wikipedia page. I am... Um, run a team of people who do editing of Wikipedia, and I won't be talking too much about that today. So I want to record a really quick little movie so that we can put it up on the Wikipedia page. And I need you guys to help me out. So I'm just going to hand my camera to some of you to film this. And then we're going to do that, and then we're all done. We're going to start with, start off. Okay, I know you guys are dying. <laughs> There it is. So, Deborah, here. Huh? Is standing? Oh. Is standing there? All you're going to do is you're going to just point this my direction and you're going to turn it like it's on already. Yeah. I'm going to go over there and just like push the button down halfway so you can kind of see that it focuses on the whole. Okay. Which button? <laughs> this button right here on the front? Ask him, he knows. <laughs> really I took a picture. Okay, so no. is it focused? Okay, so I'm going to do a quick little thing as if you guys just heard <coughs> me talking for the last few minutes. I'm going to say a couple sentences, and then I'm going to say Happy New Year, and then I just want you guys to applaud. Yay, hey, this is so exciting. You're at, you're at Skeptic Camp. And then I'm going to take the video, cut it down to like, like you know, 30 seconds, and put it up on Wikipedia. Hold on. Because we can. <laughs> Okay, you get your things ready and your excitement level, I mean, like caffeine. Yes. Okay, all right. Welcome to Monterey County Skeptics, first annual Skeptic Camp. Not only our first event, but the first in Northern California. And because today is January 3rd, 2015, it is the first Skeptic Camp in 2015. Happy New Year, everyone. Woo! Mark Edward, who is a um, mentalist, and I hope you guys all did check out his Wikipedia page. And um, he is going to be talking to you today later about his book and his blues uh, as being a psychic. And um, he's going to be emceeing the event today, so I'll let Mark start. 
going, whether you, yeah, don't touch it. If you touch it, it's liable to stop. Oh, and I was going to say, these books up here, again, we have, uh, we have lots of Skeptic Magazine. I don't know if you're familiar with this. This is, uh, I've been with Skeptic Magazine, I'm proud to say, since its inception. Here I am on the editorial board, right here. They never asked me anything, but my name is <laughs> <laughs> but, but for a while, when it first started, I, I was very active. This is kind of a, an academic Skeptic Magazine. You know, it's got lots of pie charts and graphs. And, and then Skeptical Inquirer is a little, little looser. So. You know, these are on these are on the newsstands. You know, these are on the newsstands and you should be reading them because these are, this is a really good place to start. This is kind of where I gotta start. I gotta start with Skeptical Inquirer uh, back in my magic days when Uri Geller was around and I was like, wow, this guy's bending spoons, cool, I wanna learn about it. Uh, so, you know, if you're interested, that's the, there's all these books, and as Susan says, we do want to get rid of them. We don't want to take them back with us. We have the whole bunch of skeptics, and there's some on the table over there, too. Great resources. Okay, so please avail yourself of those. Did I forget anything? Okay, so moving right along, we're going to have Kyle Polich. How do you say your name, Kyle? Polich. Polich, Polich. okay. And uh, He's going to talk to us. He has a, his specialty is statistical approaches to artificial intelligence, which is uh, something I think we need to be watchful of. You know, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories. I'm sure many people uh, are interested in this. Uh, what data can teach us, and how to apply skepticality using its application in statistics? So. Uh, this is his his specialty, and he ha also has a uh, skeptic podcast, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of us do podcasts. That's again kind of the underground, the way to uh, get our word out there. Because the, the, the real media, they don't care. You know, they they um, you know won't get into it. But you know, you got to You got to This is the new underground. I mean, look, there's a peace symbol on the window. I totally relate to that. Okay, I grew up in the '60s. We are the new underground, all right? And uh, so if you want to listen to podcasts and take the time to do it, you can learn a lot about how to meet other people just like Kyle. So Kyle's going to now come up here. Let's give him a round of applause. Kyle, Kyle. component to skepticism that's not as well talked about. So I thought that could be my contribution. Um, I did that by starting the Data Skeptic podcast that was mentioned. It features every other week like an interview with people that are doing interesting things with data. And then on alternate weeks, my wife is kind enough to join me to, who's not a data scientist, let me try and explain <coughs> a topic to her. And I hope through that people can learn a little bit about it. Because not everyone will necessarily learn about how to do a linear regression or something complex like that, but ideally people could understand what that is and what it means. So when you hear it, you at least understand fundamentally what someone's saying. Um, what's interesting about data compared to uh, homeopathy or other sorts of skeptical things we look at is data actually works. There are amazing things we can do with it, and the world's changed in a lot of ways for the better. <coughs> But that doesn't mean it's implicitly always correct. And just because someone has a fancy formula doesn't mean that what they're claiming happens to be true. So um, mostly what I want to share is that no one needs to be intimidated by formulas and data and algorithms that claims that are testable should be. And I want to look at some of those today and talk about the tools that a non-mathematician can use to be a little bit more skeptical about data-related claims. So 
What I want to look at is what crimes can teach us about uh, crime rates in particular, the presidential legacies. Are there presidents that are better on crime than others? Can the fuel economy <coughs> tell us something through data and how the regulations are put in place? Uh, can the same data tell two contradictory stories? Because it seems implicit that if you're looking at data and it's correct, then everyone should get the same conclusion. But that's not always the same the case, and a lot of it is presentation. Lastly, I want to teach an interesting story and a tool um, about how an old, worn book can help inform us about how to detect accounting fraud. So, uh, start with, uh, a lot of you guys will know this quote, Ray Hyman um, put together the categorical imperative. I know it first from Joe Nickel or Ben Radford or someone like that. The basic idea is that before you test a claim, like there's someone says there's a haunted house where uh, an old woman who was a nurse and can be seen hanging, first ask, did this woman exist? Did she live there? Did she actually hang herself? Um, because <laughs> if something didn't actually happen, then there's no reason to investigate it. So your first questions really are about, does the data actually support the claim? So people can put together a plot or a chart or a you know, some sort of composition of the data doesn't mean it actually supports what they're saying. Even if it does, <coughs> one should check that calculations were done correctly and ask questions about the provenance of the data. This is something that's underreported a lot. You should often ask if you're, you're questionable about a claim, where did this data come from? Who collected it? Can I go see it and can I reproduce the results? So let's start with one interesting uh, misleading shenanigan. I, nothing's a lie yet. This is correct data. I went to the FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting Database, and I gathered this data on crime rates. Uh, didn't discriminate on which crimes, just total crimes. I summed them up by presidential legacy for four uh, recent presidents. Um, everything here is right. What comes next is a claim. So someone could say, well, boy, the Bushes were really good on reducing crime. In fact, Bush Sr., look what he did. He took it from here at Reagan's administration, way down here, and then Clinton came and screwed it all up again. <laughs> Not true. Why? Anyone see it? Why would it be that Bush Sr. had almost half the crime that uh, was seen during the Reagan administration? Mm -hmm. That's right. His term was half as long. So. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I show here is correct, but my claim is a lie. Let's look at this a different way. This is also a lie, and I'll tell you why, but it's a little closer to the truth. Um, these lines here and these points are accurate. These are the observed data from the FBI's database of the total crime rates in each of the administration change years. Um, so by this, another person could now claim the opposite, that my first was a sort of pro-Republican claim. I could come with a pro-Democrat claim and say, well, Reagan and Bush didn't really do much, no improvement, but Clinton uh, kicked off a real downslope and Bush continued and Obama's continued. Um, crime is improving. But this is also a lie because these data points are correct, but I've drawn in these <coughs> connecting lines, which imply that there was a consistent trend there. Not the case. Uh, if we break this down by year, here's what it actually looks like by year. So it's not flat, it's varied. And what can we say about it now? If, if we want to test this claim that um, presidents, some presidents are better at reducing crime than others, uh, let's look at this trend in a bigger range. So. These black lines here are now the range we saw in the previous chart, so those administrations. And it looks like, yes, crime has been going down over this whole period of time with a few bumps. So something happened here that maybe crime is improving. But when we look historically, it doesn't seem to be that any effect from presidency comes in. And I, I'm not necessarily putting that, that claim forward that a president can't defend crime. It's just that it's not obvious from the data we have here. I just took a naive first approach and said, well, let's look by party. <laughs> From the start to the finish, how many administrations showed an increase versus a decrease? And this data, first of all, tells us nothing because it's not statistically significant. This is a very small sample size. It's also very flat and very likely due to chance. So at least from what we have here, I would lean toward the null hypothesis that the party cannot affect overall how much crime is going up or down. But there's an important thing to look at as well in that, yes, I told you where I got this from. It's the FBI's collection <laughs> database. But we should ask, why is this trend happening? Why did it go up and go down? Are, are we as Americans becoming you know, less criminally inclined? Or has the data collection process changed? Um, I don't know that particularly well. I need to go and ask questions about the provenance of the data to the FBI. Are there certain crimes that are being reclassified? Are we under-reporting certain things? Have those types of uh, activities changed? I even heard someone put forward a claim that 
this reduction in crime is largely due to the legalization of abortion because it is known that unwanted children tend to end up in criminal endeavors more often than wanted children. So perhaps that option has put less unwanted people in the world who then are less inclined to commit crimes. That's a testable claim. Uh, it seems to be supported by the data, but it's worth further investigation if you really want to push that idea forward. So how can we lie with time series data? This is a time series. It's data collected at annual intervals over a period of time. So ideally, we could look at this and say that some trend is taking place. Uh, common ways to lie. Make arbitrary groupings. This is what I did during my first slide with the, my claim that Bush 1 reduced crime. I compacted administrations, which is not fair, because some are eight, some are four years. Another thing you can do, like on my second slide, where I put those <coughs> connecting lines, put in some average or range or projection that's not there in the actual data. I hit data effectively, and I use that to lie. And you can make heterogeneous comparisons. It's certainly the case that the way the world was in the 60s is somewhat different from the way it is in the 2000s. So talking about increases and decreasing in crime is not totally a fair comparison either. So these are common ways people lie with time series data that we can all look for. Uh, one thing you want to do often in looking at time series is say, is there a trend? Is crime going up? Is it going down? There's a process called linear regression, which takes a data set and finds the best linear line that can fit through it. So this is like a, a naive linear regression. I just told the machine, find me a line that goes through this data and has the least error. That is to say, most of the data points seem to be as close as possible to it. Now, this is an utterly meaningless fit I have here, because it, it's so error prone. Clearly, this is not a linear process. Yet, I picked a linear process to maybe prove the point that time is going down. There's something that's better, but still dubious. I, uh, I said, well, this trend has been historical up and down, but there has been a consistent sort of phenomenon here since maybe the mid-90s. So let me just trim only those circles that are, I've showed on my plot, make a fit there. That fit is relatively good for the data, and it's reasonable to say that that describes it and can be projected into the future. But even that's incorrect, because if we followed either of these things, we would find that crime is going to reach zero by 2027, <laughs> respectively. So yeah, that would be great. Uh, I, I certainly hope that that might turn out to be true. Uh, I'm very skeptical of that. So. This is not a linear process, and we can look at it locally as linear, but overall we need a more robust model to describe it. We really want to talk about trends. So when someone puts a trend line on this, on data like this, they may have arithmetically done the right process, used the right algorithm, and come up with the right answer. That doesn't mean that we can now project that, and it tells us something for sure about the data. So, oops, let me go back. I don't know, I don't lie with um, you can cherry pick your data to adjust your trend. Um, uh, essentially what I did here, I picked out only those points I wanted to use. Now I did that for a reason, because I said I think that there's a recent phenomenon that's, that's different from historical phenomenon, but that is a cherry pick. And that's one way people can manipulate data and effectively lie with it. Um, another thing that uh, I see often is trimming the beginning and end of data. A lot of data tends to be cyclical. So if you look at like, I don't know, sales figures for a company, uh, depending on what type of business you're in, the month of the year will affect that. Or even whether it's a weekday or a weekend. Some people do high sales on weekends, not on weekdays. So you'll have this kind of loop-de-loop -loop if you look at the daily uh, uh, revenue for a company. So if you start your analysis at a low point and end it at a high point, you're influencing the trend to kind of go up, or vice versa to make it go down. So you can lie by how you trim the data set you're going to report on. Um, you can assume the wrong model, as I did here. This is not a linear relationship. Maybe it's reasonable to think of it linear here, but this is certainly wrong. I said I chose the wrong underlying model. Um, the other worst thing you can do is let Excel blindly fit a trend line for you. <laughs> I see this way too often, and uh, it gets on my nerves a lot. Excel's great at doing the arithmetic for you and giving you a trend line, but that doesn't mean that it's meaningful or truly describes the underlying phenomenon. I want to pull an example from one of my favorite books. If you like my talk, you should pick this up. This is a book called The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. It's by a guy named Edward Tufte, who's a real visionary in the field of um, how we present data and how we make good ways of communicating information through charts and plots and that sort of thing. So he pulled out this slide. It's a little bit dated, but it's still very useful. 
There was a time when the government put regulations on the auto industry saying you need to get fuel economy standards improved. And they set this out in a um, sort of annual um, progression that the certain standards had to be reached over a course of years. The industry was not happy with this, and this is one of the charts they put together, essentially with the claim that this is unfair. Look what the government's doing to us. They're, they're, they're running us down the road. This is crazy. We have to go from here all the way to here, and we just got from 78 to 85. How can we accomplish this? We even see that the threatening numbers are getting bigger. Look at the concept of 27. <laughs> um, we see a couple of lines that don't necessarily mean anything. This, this line here, what's it telling us? So I'd like to strip this out and really present the data in a different way, a more simple way. So let's see what happens when I just extract the actual information presented here. Strip away their data, and now I'm going to move that um, mm -hmm. into a better chart. This is when I've, I've taken those values and now line them up so that they all are even on the left margin here. This is the plot. Um, their presentation of the data in a more clean format. Years, and these are the actual values of the government regulations. But when I take these numbers <coughs> and I make my own bar chart, it looks like this. Why is that? These are, these are all stretched out. Um, in this chart, there's something unfair there. They're not, this line in its length doesn't equal this line in its length, at least matching those numbers. So, let's, uh, Tucky defines something called the lie factor. I really like this. I hope more skeptics start adopting this. You take the size of the effect shown in the graph, divided by the size of the actual effect of the data, and that tells you how badly it's lying. <laughs> Ideally, all data would be a lie factor of 1.0 means that these are equal. Um, here's what we have when we look at uh, the data from the auto industry. Let's take that uh, value of 18 miles per gallon as the baseline and say that that's even and we use that as now our, our, our unit of measurement. Well, by that account, we see that the lie factor is pretty extreme in a lot of these cases. If you look at the, the most recent, that, that running us down on the highway line at 27.5, that's 490% greater of a line length than it should be. Um, and in fact, it's increasing over time, we see. They start out lying a little bit, a little bit more, and have done a good job in emphasizing how unfair these standards are by lying to us. So how do you lie with misrepresentation of data? Um, you can stretch it out as they've done, make lines that aren't the correct length, make pie charts that are confusing or, or not labeled as accurately as they could be. Confusing graphical elements are a, a real problem. And, and I know everyone wants to be cute in their designs and plots, so someone might have presented this as a bar chart where there are cars that are filling up with you know different colors, but that's actually really hard to read. And the simple line chart, the simple bar chart, tell most of the stories we need to tell and in a way that people can understand and don't misrepresent the data uh, terribly so. Um, that's why I encourage people never invent your own method of presentation. If I have to look at your plot, and take me five minutes to even figure out what it's saying, <laughs> odds are other people are not going to convey, get the message you're trying to convey as well. Um, mislabeling your axes is another one that you'll see oftentimes, um, and I'll have an example of that coming up. So here's how I would present the data where I wanted to, to show this. This is the years and the miles per gallon. So this is what the, the old one was, this is where it ends. Now, I'm not going to claim that the standards the government set were unfair, perhaps they were, but I think the industry's presentation of the data was not telling us or giving us the right perspective on that. And as far as I know, you know, I'm not an engineer in this field to, to be able to say whether this is too aggressive or not, but it's clear to me what the government actually set in place was easy restrictions, a little bit greater and a leveling off. So not doesn't appear to be terribly uh, aggressive. Here's another way I could present that same data. Accurate as well. Uh, what I've done here is I've trimmed off the first 18 miles per gallon so that we can see a little bit more descriptive way to represent it. Is this a better or a worse presentation than the previous slide? Really? Yeah, it really depends. Um, this shows us a little bit more about how the um, sequence is going, that it's, it's a little increase, bigger increase, and topping off. So if you're trying to say something about that, this is a fine presentation. Uh, but it does stretch the data, which emphasizes how big of a cliff this is. So uh, a, a chart alone doesn't tell the whole story, which is unfortunate because we'd like to think that data can speak for itself. But sometimes it can, sometimes it can't. Here's another presentation. This one's just awful. 
Um, let's talk about some of the ways that I ruined the data here. Uh, essentially, I made it look flat, in which case saying, come on, auto industry, why, guys, why can't you guys do this? It looks easy. Uh, I've also stretched the axes out here so that yeah, everything above 60, this is useless. This space tells us nothing. It also has uh, no tick marks here to give us any indication of, of what these values actually are. So this is uh, as bad, if not worse, than the original presentation. Same data, just different stretching of the axes. Um, here's another story. Uh, and also accurate. Actually, I'm not 100% sure that these data points are true. I couldn't find good provenance on what standards have been before years preceding and preceding. But assuming that this was sort of a one-time transition, this data could be accurate. Just tells a slightly different story. Here, I would assume a claimant would be saying that we're going to make a change, and then it's going to be flat. You need to get to a certain level, and then we're good. Um, is it a better or worse presentation? Depends on what you're trying to say. Um, lying with scale is often a great way to do it. This is an accurate data set. <laughs> the US national debt versus my net worth. Um, anybody want to guess what my net worth is? <laughs> it's not zero. It's smaller than one family trillion. Best answer yet. <laughs> so uh, this tells us absolutely nothing. Uh, and you see a lot of charts like this, and one might try and emphasize, oh, my net worth is, is so low. but not necessarily the case. So does data tell us the whole story? Is it enough for data to be correct? No, it's, it's, it's necessary, but not sufficient for data to be correct. We also have to present it in an honest way. Um, so what's the most honest presentation of that fuel data? It kind of depends. Um, it, what's the story you're trying to tell? What's the claim you're trying to make? If your claim is that these are fair, some of the earlier slides I, I put in, uh, you know, this one might be good. If you're trying to say that it's Talk about the rate of the change. This one might be good. Uh, this one's never good. So it, this might be good if you were trying to say it's a one-time change. It all depends on the claim that's attached to the data. Um, I wanted to close with a great little tool that I think a lot of people can use in their everyday life. Despite the formula, I know sometimes a thing like a logarithm can scare people. Um, I'm going to walk you through how to do this, and then we'll talk about how it's been useful. So there was a guy named Frank Benford who, back before we all had um, powerful computing devices we walk around with, if you wanted to calculate something like the sine of, of an odd number, or the logarithm, or a square root, these were hard arithmetic calculations, so often you'd get these giant books that would have all those pre-calculated, so if you want to know the square root of 2, you could go look it up the page that has 2, and there would be your answer rather than solving it by hand. So, Benford went through his book of logarithms, and he noticed after maybe a couple decades that on the spine of it, it was wearing unevenly. He found it to be really dirty near the top, but not as dirty near the edges. And he took notice of that and said, why is it that my book isn't uniformly dirty? And he discovered Benford's law, which tells us that for some data sets, not all, but some, there's this interesting property that different digits come up, different first digits come up more prevalently. And this is the formula by which you can calculate that. So maybe a better way to, answer, to understand that is to look at some actual numbers. Numbers, all the numbers 1 through 20. Everyone in the room, think of how many cars you've owned in your life. Uh, I'm a 3. Um, but I imagine few people have owned more than 20 cars, so hopefully everyone's number's up here. Now watch what happens when I turn all the 1's through. There are 11 numbers here, right, that tend that, that um, start with the number one. So in this data set, probably the majority of people will have a number that starts with the number one. This is common in lengths of books, in number of followers on Twitter, as I'll show you in a second, and in a lot of things. It's not always true, but it's commonly true, and it's commonly true in <coughs> financial data as well. Um, so through this, we've been able to, a lot of investigators have looked at financial fraud. When people want to cook the books, they often make up numbers, you know, out of the top of their head or with dice or something like that. And they tend to think, oh, these should be uniformly spread out, otherwise it looks like a pattern. But there's actually a pattern there, and the absence of a pattern is something that's a bit suspicious. So this is the percentage of time that you should expect to find each digit. One the most prevalent, two, three, so on and so forth. So I want to do something a little bit applied with this. So I looked at how that would apply to guests from last year's The Amazing Meeting, 2014. So first, let's talk about the provenance of the data. I went to the TAM website, to their speakers list, and I pulled off everyone who had a Twitter ID listed there. 
Um, there were some speakers that didn't. Uh, Donald Prothero was surprised that he was, didn't have a Twitter. It doesn't seem to, which is sad because I'd love to follow him on Twitter. But um, of those listed, according to that web page, I, as of uh, January 1st at 11.26 a.m., I used the Twitter API to pull how many followers each of them had. Now let's look at that as a chart. Um, this does somewhat follow Benford's distribution. Um, I'll show you a few more things in the next slides, but let's first talk about how useful this is. Just like my national debt versus net worth example, it's hard to say much about this long tail of guess. So a better way someone might present this data is to put it on the logarithm scale. So a logarithm, the best intuition for it is think about the Richter scale. It's a logarithm scale. The Richter of four is much worse <coughs> so compare four to a three, that's a much worse gain than three to a two. It uh, sort of has this exponential um, shape to it. So if I log all of their followers, I see a little bit more about the actual distribution. And it tells a truer story of how many followers each of these people had. Um, is it a good fit to Benford's law? Does this really describe the data? Well, it's a small sample size. There weren't that many speakers. So it's kind of hard to say. It does seem to, you know, the, the Blue is the actual distribution, the black is the followers with the first digit count. But it could very well have easily shifted with just one or two different speakers. If Bill Nye had been there and someone else who didn't start with a one as he did, we might have seen something different. So I looked at my followers. If anybody's on Twitter, this is me. I like to tweet about skeptical things and data stuff. Um, and I hope to actually spend 2015 tweeting. Uh,